Good afternoon, everyone. I see we uh, have a nice full house today for today's speaker. My name is Eric Conway. I'm the JPL historian. I work in the Communications and Education Directorate. Um, and the first thing we always have to say at the beginning of talks like this is, please make sure you turn off your phones. Set them not to ring. If you still have a pager, uh, maybe dunk it in some oil or something, because it probably doesn't work anyway. Um, but let's give Gentry a nice, quiet uh, audience. Now, I have the pleasure and the honor today to introduce you to Gentry Lee, um, who many of you probably already know, um, and some far better than I. Gentry is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin in liberal arts. He took a master's degree in general science at the frigid edition of Caltech in Boston's Back Bay. What's it called? The other one, MIT. <laughs> started a PhD at the University of Glasgow in applied math. I say started because, as he told me back in 2005 when I first interviewed him, he left because he was tired of being broke. <laughs> he went into industry instead, wound up at, Lock at Martin, what is now Lockheed Martin, but was then Martin Marietta, way back in 1965. That brought him into the Viking Project, subject of today's talk. I'll skip that story, as I think he's got plenty to say about it today himself. After all that excitement of Viking, Martin Marietta tried to send him to get an MBA and become a senior business manager. He left instead. He came to JPL as a section manager. He quickly left that job um, to take a job with John Cassani on the Galileo mission to Jupiter. At this time, he's also began his collaboration with Carl Sagan to help shape the original Cosmos series that aired, I believe, in 79 and 80. Galileo, as you'll see in an upcoming documentary that Blaine Baggin and I have been working on, had almost endless delays. It was supposed to launch in 82, then 84, and then it was 86, and then the Challenger accident happened. By that time, Gal Gentry was chief engineer of Galileo, and he realized that there's not a lot to do for a chief engineer on a project that's not going anywhere for possibly years. So he began phasing himself out of JPL, um, and instead wound up working with Arthur C. Clarke on the Ramah series of science fiction novels, another phase of his careers. And then he wrote other novels and designed a few video games. The Internet Speculative Fiction Database credits him with nine books. That's two more than me. So I got some catching up to do. He also began consulting for JPL in the 1990s, and that's what eventually brought him back. He was a review board member for on Tony Spears' Mars Pathfinder, consulted for NASA headquarters on the reconstruction of the Mars program after the 1999 losses, and in 2001 was asked by Dr. Alachi to return to JPL full time. Please all join me in welcoming Gentry Lee to our stage. Thank you, Eric. Now, for those of you who know me well and have heard some of my Viking stories, can you imagine how hard it is for me to cram all of my stories into 55 minutes? I'm going to do the best I can, all right? First of all, you have to have the context for Viking. So let's go back to the 19th century. There's an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli who uses a new telescope and finds things on Mars that are called canale. And of course, Americans have always been good in foreign languages. And by the time the story got into the Washington Post or the New York Times, there were canals on Mars. And everybody was very excited about the intelligent beings that, that made them. And then Percival Lowell didn't have anything else to do, so he searched a long time, found a big place for a wonderful telescope, and found canals on Mars. And as we said, in Cosmos, the intelligence was there, but it was on this side of the telescope, not on that side of the telescope. But the point of all this is that 100 years ago, any intelligent educated person in the United States of America or anywhere else would have thought the probability that there was not just life but intelligence on Mars was virtually certain. So certain it was that in 1938 when Orson Welles did a non-commercial radio program that lasted for two hours, he had the Martians landing in New Jersey and there was panic up and down the East Coast and no one even stopped for a moment to wonder why any self-respecting Martian would land in New Jersey. <laughs> it's important that you have that background because I'm going to describe to you 
what was the big, gigantic step forward in our understanding of Mars and what turned out to be the beginning of the work that we all do here now today. And in 1964, I'm going to give you, you're all scientists and engineers. I want you to imagine the following notional graph, okay? The probability that there's life on Mars in the mind of the, an educated person as a function of time. I already told you it was one in 1938. In 1964, a JPL spacecraft that had a 512-bit capability <laughs> flew by Mars and saw the southern hemisphere, and that number that I just defined plummeted close to zero because, after all, Mars was just like the moon. And it was in that environment and in the post-Apollo stages that we began to talk about going to Mars with a real mission. In 1967, 1968, some in 1966, people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and in industry contracts all studied what it might be like to send a scientific mission to Mars. There were lots of options, come out of orbit, go direct, land a rough lander, ran, land a soft lander, and everybody was getting all excited. There was just one problem. Every time somebody estimated how much it cost, they would come up with such gigantic numbers as $175 million. <laughs> and everybody couldn't figure out how in the world that could happen. But because there was a struggle for a while. JPL wanted to run the mission, but they completely underestimated one human being, and he will be back and forth in this conversation today. His name was Jim Martin. And if you ever had a chance to know him, and some of you did, I will tell you he was the quintessential project manager of all time, in my opinion. John Cassani gets upset with me when I tell John that he was the second best, the close second is best that I, project manager that I ever saw. But Jim Martin was at the Langley Research Center in Virginia, and he had run the Lunar Orbiter Project very successfully, and he marched on Washington, not with a 1,000 people, by himself, and informed NASA headquarters that he was going to manage the Viking mission and manage it. He did. Right, Fred? He sure did. He sure did. <laughs> so for those of you who want your history corrected, because I've run into all sorts of people who think that JPL built the landers that landed on Viking, they did not, OK? The mission was run by the Langley Research Center, the JPL built the two orbiters, there were two Viking orbiters, and the Martin Marietta Corporation, where I was working, and I'll tell you one minute, and I have no longer than that. I, how did I get on to Viking? That's a long, long story. It took me one year to find out that aerospace companies are invariant under a time and location transformation. It took me another six months to find out that if you're ever going to get anywhere in life, you better do it yourself, because sure as hell, nobody else is going to help you. And by that time, it was time to write the Viking proposal, and I was in the right place at the right time. And I spent the rest of my, my uh, career while I was there working on Viking. So in 1968, Martin Marietta got the contract to build these landers. Now, for those of you who are into technology readiness levels, I'll give you a quick summary. This is after the fact. Looking back, the technology readiness level of the lander was 2.4. The three most important instruments, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, the biology instrument, okay, the camera was 1.6, all right? The GCMS, Jeff, was minus 1.7, <laughs> and the biology instrument was minus eight, okay? There was absolutely no way anybody could have built any of those instruments that were proposed at that time. We started the project. We were just, abs those of us, I mean, I could not imagine. I was working on the first spacecraft that was ever going to land on the planet Mars and stay there for a period, of, a significant period of time. Wow, how could you have, have a job like that? The first year, we realized there was no way in hell we were going to launch in 1973. I mean, the, the, there, there were no schedules that anybody could believe that could even get anything done by 1973. And so Jim Martin famous man, played chicken with NASA headquarters. They were having budget problems, okay? And they kept saying, we may have to delay. Oh, no, Jim says, you can't do that. If you delay us, you're going to have to give me another $100 million. He knew he needed at least $200 million more already, okay? <laughs> so to make a long story short, 
In early 1970, those of us who had already been working around the clock and were going crazy, suddenly got a wonderful pass from NASA headquarters. The mission was going to be delayed to launch in 1975. Ha, funny story. First, they told us we were going to delay to launch in 1974. And Jim came to me and says, will you please explain to those people you can't go to Mars every year? <laughs> and I had to explain to a member of the White House staff that it was not like the bus to Arlington. He said to me on the phone, if I want to go to Arlington, I go out and get the bus. If I don't get that one, I get the next one. What's the problem? So we were scheduled to launch in 1975. That began a wonderful period of my life. The first thing that happened is Jim reshuffled everything. He had probably somewhere in the back of his mind or maybe on a sheet of paper about 10 or 12 people that he had to live with in order to get done by 1973, but he sure as hell wasn't going to live with them if he, had, if he had two more years. And so he cleaned house at Martin Marietta. There were a lot of people at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who disappeared. Some of us got bigger roles. I got a bigger role, and I had the pleasure from that point forward of working intimately with people at JPL. And that was when I met one of my colleagues who's here today, who's one of my close friends, and I will tell you right now, there has never been somebody in mission design and mission engineering who approaches this man. He did it on Voyager, he did it on Cassini. Charlie Cole Hayes, take a bow, please. Stand up. So we had a problem. The first thing we discovered was what everybody knows now who worked on inside of the bottom, there were trajectories that you could fly to Mars in which you couldn't figure out where the hell you were because it was flying like this and you couldn't get the data. And in those days we only had Doppler and, and uh, range and range rate data. So that was the first crisis that we had, but we had many, many more. I'll summarize just a couple of them for you. First of all, we had signed a fixed price contract for the lander computer. <laughs> okay. No one even knew what it was, what it had to do. No one had even written down any requirements, and Honeywell accepted a fixed price contract. They worked for six months and then announced they were not going to do another thing <laughs> because there was no way they could escape without losing at least... $20 million. Now, when I use numbers, I'm using fiscal $75. Multiply them by 5.6. Multiply all the numbers by 5.6, and you'll get. So Viking cost, after it was all over $900 million, multiplied by 5.6, you can see it was a pretty big mission. Hey, two landers, two orbiters, not so bad altogether. So that was a big crisis. We solved that one by changing the contract, of course. But it was the science instruments. First, I should give credit where credit's due. JPL built an orbiter that was a knockoff of the Mariner 71 mission, and therefore they did not ma massively overrun. <laughs> the lander, on the other hand, uh, just inched up, you know, $50 million a quarter. There was one point where somebody at headquarters told, said to Jim Martin, said, did you know that your cost to go has increased each of the last three quarters? And Jim said, yeah, but not as much as I expected. <laughs> and that was what we were dealing with. So just to give you a few numbers so that you can appreciate, those of you who think you've had overruns when, that were 75% or so forth, the original estimated cost for the biology instrument when it was accepted was $6.4 million. Okay? By the time it was at PDR, it was 12.8. Somewhere after PDR, they threw off one of the experiments. The final cost was $57 million. Okay, now depending on whether or not you want to start at PDR, it's a factor of five, or if you want to go all the way back to when it was accepted, it's a factor of 10. Okay, and they threw one of the, the items off. So I'm going to go forward because I only have 55 minutes. And we're going to get to the time we're starting to approach launch. My job at that time was, without going through all the different things I did on the way, I was then the, selected by Jim to be the science analysis and mission planning director for the mission, which meant that I ran all the scientists, ha, huh, and, and all the mission planners and the mission designers. We had a spiff pad which was spacecraft performance and flight path analysis that was mostly JPL, and then we had a mission control directorate too. But my other job, and the job that I had no idea how much fun and difficult it was gonna be, is I was made head of landing site certification. 
Now, there had been a long activity associated with landing site selection. And there were human beings on, in the world who believed that we were going to land at those sites that all those people spent all that time arguing about, Fred, before we got there. I was not one of those. Jim took me aside and he said, now I'm giving you this job because I know it's going to be impossible. All right. Now, I have to tell you one funny story along the way. Charlie wanted me to tell you that, that we had a, a mission design meeting at, uh, at Las Vegas during the time the Viking was going on, and it got investigated. But uh, I, I don't, <laughs> there, he'll stand up and he'll tell you, we did all the research, it was the cheapest flights, the easiest place to stay, and so forth, but don't have a, a meeting in Las Vegas if you don't want to be investigated. Anyway, we had many cost scrubs. I'm gonna tell you only about one meeting where it was a CCB to take the lamp off the top of the lander. Now, don't ask me why the lamp cost $140,000. It did, okay? And at this meeting, everybody got up and said, you know, we, it's perfectly fine to take the lamp off, except for one man, Carl Sagan. And he asked me, is it time for me to speak now? And I said, yes, and he got up. And he talked for 10 minutes, and he imagined, he says, just think what it's going to be like. <laughs> Every morning, we look out, and we see these little footprints from the nocturnal animals that we didn't see because we took the light off the lander. <laughs> so... Here we go. It's time. June the 22nd, 20, June the 20th, Viking 1 goes into orbit. I mean, we are fired up. Oh, I meant to tell you, we had several ORTs. We failed them ranging from absolutely off the wall bad to miserably, and Jim Martin fired us all. Then he came back and he told us there was no way he could get anybody else to do what we were doing, so he'd have to live with us. <laughs> and we'd have to figure out how to do our job a whole lot better. You have to realize nobody had ever done this before. I mean, I was uh, the, Tom Young and I designed the mission operations strategy. Okay, we made lots and lots of mistakes. You know, we had timelines of what people were supposed to do. Okay, so there were a few people who had to work 20 hours a day for five days in a row. We didn't pick that up, you know. We didn't have somebody who'd gone before and done that. So June the 20th, we go into orbit. June the 22nd, this is 1976, folks, long time ago. June the 22nd, the first photographs come down of the pre-selected landing site. And I'm telling you, there was an incredible scramble to look at those pictures. And I remember going into the room, Jim Martin was standing here. I'm gonna show you a picture in just a minute. Mike Carr was standing here. Hal Mazursky was standing here. And Carl was standing over here. And Hal Mazursky looks down, he starts shaking his head, and he says, we're not gonna land there. <laughs> I'd like to show you the first slide, please. This picture contains the first selectees in Gentry Lee's Planetary Exploration Hall of Fame, which does not exist, but should. Why in the world is there an Astronaut Hall of Fame? There's even an E-Games, X-Games Hall of Fame. There's no such thing as a Planetary Exploration Hall of Fame, and there should be. Let me tell you who these people are, folks. Jerry Soffin, project scientist on Viking. Hal Mazursky, one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. Toby Owen, who invented understanding of planetary atmospheres. Mike Carr, the chairman of the, uh, of the orbiter imaging team. You know that guy? <laughs> Carl Sagan, that is Jim Martin, the Prussian general standing 6'4 with a white-haired flat top, and that is Tom Young. What are they doing? This is the way we did it in those days. They are standing around a table looking at images of tentative landing site number three. What's happening here? Ah, let me tell you. Okay, off of the slide now. We were supposed to land on July the 4th. Some of you may remember that was the 200th anniversary of the United States of America. It was all planned. We had it choreographed all the way down to Gerald Ford stumbling off the plane when he would come to <laughs> arrive in, in, in California. We weren't going to land on July the 4th. Somebody had to tell the president. 
Jim Martin took a phone call. And he told President Ford we were not going to land. One of Ford's advisors interrupted the phone call to say, don't you realize this is an election year and you're going to cause trouble for the president by not landing on July the 4th without missing a beat? Jim Martin says, well, perhaps he would think that it's better to land safely some other time than to crash on July the 4th. <laughs> so my team went into overdrive. Jim ordered us every day to have the following scenarios all prepared. What happens if the next place we look at is good? What's the place after that we're going to look at? And what's the place after that we're going to look at? And he, we're supposed to have all the timelines, the scenarios, the staffing, everything done for every day, every time we would come to a landing site. Meantime, people were trying to figure out what the photographs meant what the radar meant, and what the infrared thermal mapper built by Hugh Kiefer meant. I'm smiling because I'm looking at Matt Gollenbeck, who is the beginning and the ending of true landing site selection and certification. He says to me all the time, says, you guys were lucky, and I say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the conversations were hysterical because people were trying to extrapolate using what they call geomorphological evidence down to a place where nobody had ever seen before. And it was pure guesswork. Meanwhile, the radar people were going, um, like this. They would come in with their latest discovery, and Jim Martin would scratch his head. He would take me back to the office and says, do you believe anything they say? <laughs> and and we, so we used seven different sites that were rejected. Okay, it took three weeks. We all slept in the office mostly, and that was all, what it was all about. We were coming, getting worn out, but there was something else about to happen. Viking 2 was about to arrive at Mars, and we had proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that the flight team could not possibly manage two vehicles at once, and so therefore, we better get, get our act together. At three o'clock in the morning, on July the 12th, for those of you who are keeping score, we're now three weeks after we went into orbit around Mars, Hal Mazursky put his head down on the table and then he says, I don't know if this place is okay, but it's better than any of the rest of them we've seen, at least I think it is, and I am GD tired, plop. <laughs> he went. And so we decided on the 12th that we would go down. And then we had to do one final maneuver on the 16th, and then on the 20th of July, we would separate, we were in orbit, for those of you who haven't figured this all out now, we didn't go direct. We would separate from the orbiter and we would be three and a half hours of an autonomous sequence. Now for those of you who run 10,000 Monte Carlo runs of EDL on your workstation these days, do you want to know how we analyzed EDL back in those days? We did it one selected set of parameters overnight, the mainframe machine, Analyze the whole, if you put the wrong number in there, the next morning you got slapped. That was all there was to it. Now, I wanna back up for one moment and I wanna spend just a minute on one other thing before I tell you about the landing. There was a set of tests done in 1972 and 1973 that represent the biggest EDL legacy from Viking or from any other mission. They were called the Balloon Launch Decelerator Tests. When the price of these tests was originally quoted to Jim Martin, he stood up, I'll never forget this, and he said to all those assembled who were designing the tests, I do not care how much they cost. I only care that we know after the tests are over that we have a system that will land safely on Mars as long as Mars doesn't by itself screw us up. We had to deal with five different atmospheres. Our environmental requirements document said, you must be successful in any of the five following atmospheres. We knew nothing at all about the terrain, zero. So what we did was the following. The lander was designed to a certain set of things, and then they told us on the landing site certification team, try to find a place that fits that description. This was so hysterically funny. Jim said to me, he says, do you think the terrain down there is going, I have foggiest idea. Nobody did. So it happened. Early in the morning on July the 20th, the lander headed for the surface. This, these were moments that everybody who participated in the Viking mission will never forget for a moment. It came down. We knew that the data was coming back 
to the orbiter, but we did not know what that data set. We knew we had a touchdown, and then we waited. We waited while the orbiter turned and then started sending its data down. The next one, please. This was the first photograph ever taken from the, surf, from the surface of Mars by a mission that lasted for longer than 120 seconds. <laughs> the Russians went to Mars seven times, and their longest mission was 120 seconds long. And you see the scratchiness over here on the left? That's this, these came down in strips, and it took almost a minute for one strip to come all the way down. By the time the first strip came down, it was 5 o'clock in the morning, because we'd been up all night long, there was not a dry eye in the house. I was a mess. All I could do was think of seven years of work, averaging who knows how much. Sometimes I say 55 hours a week. I don't even know how much it was. And here it came. And my son, Robert, who's in the audience, once asked me, why in the world did you take such a stupid picture of, of, <laughs> of, the, of, of, of the foot pad? Folks, one third of the scientists on Viking thought we would hit the ground and go glug, 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 glug. And that would be it. Because they thought the surface might be made out of rapid shave or something. Oh, you don't have rapid shave anymore. What do you call it? Foamy or something like that. Okay, off with the picture. So that began the landed mission. We had a disaster on day number two. No, I think it was day number four. We were supposed to deploy the surface sampler and get a sample. It didn't move. Big crisis. Why didn't it move? Oh, boy. You're going to see me? You want to know how red my face was? Okay. After we figured it out, Jim informed me, he was such a good, so good about this, that I was going to get to explain to the mass of media that there were hundreds and hundreds of reporters from all over the world that because that was before social media and all that sort of stuff. And so I stood up there, and Jim introduced me the following way. He said, you've all met Gentry before. You remember the site certification days? Well, now he's managing, and he went through this, and he says, now I want you to know he's probably done a million things right, but now he's going to tell you about one thing he did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I stood up and I said, folks, there's nothing wrong with the surface sampler. We simply forgot to remove the locking pin. <laughs> How could that happen? It happened because we never had the locking pin in on any test we ever did. Okay? And so the locking pin was put in. And we Okay, so we took the surface sample and we went out and we dug, dug samples and we gave them to the uh, instruments. A moment now about the instruments. The biology instrument had three different parts. It had a pyrolytic re release report, which was the, the PI of whom was Norm Horowitz, a chaired professor at Caltech that becomes very important in the story as I go on. It had a labeled release component and the PI was Gil Levin who had a fantastic advanced degree in sanitation from some university, I've forgotten where, and Vance Oyama from NASA Ames. The other very important experiment was the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer built by, under the, 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 the leadership of Klaus Beeman at MIT. But that, those were the ones that we were going to, uh, we said were the life, you know, those that were looking for life. Okay, we had a lot of other great things, and I, I could spend time talking about how the, the, the Dr. George on the TV station here was give us the weather report on, from Mars every day and all that sort of stuff, but I want to concentrate on those. Right from the beginning, we ran a democratic show. We didn't have all sorts of public relations and media people telling us what to say to whom and when. We allowed anybody to talk to any scientist or engineer whenever they wanted to. And as a result, after the first sample was analyzed in Richmond, Virginia, the newspaper led, said, life found on Mars. In Norfolk, Virginia, and across the state, headlines said, no life on Mars. <laughs> They'd talk to different scientists, okay? Now, let me tell you what the story was. Josh Lederberg once told us all that he was a Nobel laureate. For those of you who don't know, he was on the Viking program. There was, there was several, there was two Nobel laureates who worked on the program and six others who in a closeted room told me why they should have won. But <laughs> at any rate, Josh Lederberg says, we were earth chauvinists. We designed instruments to go to Mars that reflected our a priori conceit 
that life, if it existed anywhere else, would follow all the paradigms that life follows on the earth. Nobody spent any time working out what I call the ambiguity hyperbox, which is what if this instrument says this and this instrument says that, how do you then conduct the instruments in such a way as to, and so of course, the public was completely confused. They didn't know what to make of all this. Truth, we were too. We had no idea. Every single sample we took, the labeled release said, looks like life. No, I'm not saying is life, looks like life. Norm Horowitz's pyrolytic release, which was taking the sample, pyrolyzing it up to very high temperature, and every time verifying that carbon, from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, was making it into more complex chemicals, the analog of photosynthesis on the planet Earth, that was happening as well. But the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer never saw a single organic compound. And so the scientists all got together when pressed in a major press conference to say what the answer was. And Norm Horowitz declared, there's no life here, period. Gil Levin, remember the guy with the labeled release, he's still alive and still claims that we, he found life on Viking on Mars, said, yes, but, but those of you who have ever read Antoine Saint-Exupéry's Le Petit Prince, Remember the Turkish astronomer who went to the big meeting and announced this major discovery and nobody paid any attention to him because he was in Turkish garb and he went back and wore European garb the next year and he won the biggest award for the biggest discovery that was made there? How do you think the scientific community reacted when a chaired professor at Caltech said there's no life on Mars and a sanitation engineer from somewhere on the East Coast said, yes, there is. All right, unfortunately, unfortunately, people thought at the end of all this that there was no life on Mars. And that graph that I talked to you about earlier that, that reached a low in 1964 had come back a little bit because Mariner 71 had found water in the atmosphere and water at the poles and all that sort of stuff. It plummeted to nearly its all-time low. But that was not... There were some experiences on Viking, however, that had nothing to do with the science or the engineering that we were doing that I will never forget. One of them came on day 14 after Viking Lander 1 had landed. By this time, all of us were exhausted and we realized that the only way the reporters were gonna write anything that made sense was if we let them interpret the pictures themselves. One of the reasons that Carl and I did Cosmos is that after the Viking was all over, we had a conversation, and we said the sense of excitement and wonder in what we do is being absolutely you know, choked. And there's two reasons. Reporters know nothing about science and technology, and most scientists and engineers are poor communicators. And the result is garbage in and garbage out. So it's day 14 now, you got it? I get up off my cot, I walk over to my office, and there my, my secretary, Jenny Asnan, is trembling. She says, Gentry. She says, ABC is on line one. NBC is on line two. CBS is on line three. And she shuddered and said, and the National Enquirer is on lane four. <laughs> I did what you would do. I picked up line four. <laughs> I heard this deep voice say to me, hello there, Gentry Lee. What do you have to say about the writing on the rocks on Mars? Now, six hours earlier, a photograph had come down of a rock on Mars and clearly marked in shadows was a B and a G. Those are my initials for those of you who don't know that. Okay. And the, the public relations, or excuse me, the, the journalism community, those that had only three of them whom had attended my lecture on the epi, the, what happens on the epistemology of the scientific method, had informed everybody at JPL that they were all going to come for a press conference on the writing on the rocks on Mars. I said, really? Are you kidding me? It's just a combination of sunlight and shadows. Get ready. Hundreds of reporters, including all three reporters from the Los Angeles local television stations, were sitting in the front row with cameras whirring from all sides, 
we did a deadpan 30-minute press conference in which different members of the science team got up and showed how a combination of sunlight and shadows on the planet Earth had created all kinds of amazing phenomena, including the first verse of the 23rd Psalm in Sanskrit on the walls of a Turkish cave. Okay. <laughs> After 30 minutes, we sat down, and I stood up, and I said with a big smile like this, what? Are there any questions? Sitting right there, right there. The leading anchor woman, I will not name her, she sat in the libel once, stood up and said, oh, Gentry, that was an exciting press conference. When are you going to tell us about the writing on the rocks on Mars? <laughs> I lost it. I was tired. And I said, mm. I don't mention her name, I'm protecting myself. Mm. It is conceivable that at some time in the dim, dark, distant past, there was intelligent life on Mars. Very low probability, but conceivable. And it is plausible, barely plausible, very, very small number, that that intelligent life that once lived on Mars would look up at the sky and decide it wanted to communicate with intelligent creatures somewhere else. But miss, mm, there is no number small enough to compute the probability that intelligent life that once might have existed on Mars would decide to communicate with intelligence elsewhere using Latin letters. <laughs> she didn't get it. <laughs> so, Lander 2 landed in a pile of rocks. Matt loves this picture. Show the, show the, show the panorama of Lander 2. This was in Utopia Planitia. Okay, you see a few rocks? Okay, Matt asked me once if I would compute, what was the probability that we were successful given where we landed? It's, it's about 85%. Okay, so we were lucky, you know? You know that for a long time, everybody thought all Mars looked like this? Remember what happened to Pathfinder Line? It had the same sort of stuff everywhere on Mars. And when we landed with, with uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, everybody said, where are the rocks? They're not there. So going forward, same results over and over again. Pyrolytic release says, maybe life here. Labeled release says, there may be life, but Norm Horowitz says, nope, there's something going on in the soil, some kind of chemistry we do not understand. We didn't have any ambiguity hyperboxes. Every, all the reporters were saying, these guys don't know their ass from a hole in the ground, and that was what was happening, all right? So they believed Norm. Now, we, took five samples. The two missions were supposed to last 90 days apiece. You all know they lasted three years. JPL has continued that same tradition with their own missions. And out of desperation, when we were about to run on the prime mission on Lander 2, Carl Sagan walked into a science planning meeting and said, I've got it. I'm not going to do any more Carl imitation. I'll just tell you what he said. <laughs> he said, what has happened is that as the atmosphere on Mars escaped, the ultraviolet light pierced through the ozone and is killing all the things on the ground, breaking all the carbon compounds. The reason we're not finding any organic material is because all the carbon compounds have been. So we need to get a sample from a place that has not been exposed to the environment for a long, long time. So you know what we did? I'm jumping right to the bottom line because I'm going to run out of time. We used the surface sampler to push a big rock out of the way and took a sample from underneath the rock. I have to tell you, it was hysterical. We had the whole setup here. And when we were doing the practice getting ready, here is uh, Hank Moore, Carl Sagan, Hal Mazursky, all of them with their jeans rolled up playing around in the sample. No, push this way, as they were showing the surface sample or what to do. And we got the sample, and guess what? Had the same results as all the rest. And so, for a long, long period of time, there was belief that we hadn't found anything that could possibly resume life. And then after a while, this chart that I was telling you about, the likelihood of life today or in the past on Mars in the mind of an educated person on the planet Earth has been steadily up. It went up with MER, it went up with Curiosity, and it's probably still going up today. But it went up 10 years after Viking was over, when we had a 10-year scientific reunion, and Mike Carr, who by this time had digested literally tens of thousands 
of orbiter photographs, came up with an argument about the water that existed everywhere on Mars, and basically set the stage for the discoveries by Odyssey of all the water in the, in the mid-levels. And that shows you that science cannot be done in a moment. There are many things you can say about Viking. One that I've been criticized, they said, you guys did everything that could be done for a reasonable amount of money, and that's why there were no missions for the next 20 years. That's partially true. We were told during one of our intermediate reviews that we should have built a sphere, put it inside airbags, and have a little slit for a window that we could, and then have the thing roll out, and we'd take a picture of the surface of Mars, and everybody would be ecstatic. Jim Martin wasn't hearing it. You all realize in this room that we landed softly twice. We had a parachute. We had a heat shield. We had throttleable engines. The entire way we land on Mars was undefined before Viking, became defined at Viking. Just two days ago, well, three days ago, in a meeting with all the Mars 2020 experts on the parachute, there were many references to the Viking balloon launch decelerator tests. They were the most complete set of tests that anybody has ever done to validate the kinds of landings in her Mars. The scientific legacy, people argue, is not so strong. I say, you are wrong. What did we learn? Homocentric, earth chauvinist attitudes do not design life detection instruments, number one. Number two, Understand when you set out what you are going to do if the responses you get from the data don't tell you what you a priori thought they were going to tell you. Know what your next step is going to be. As we design missions now to go to ocean worlds and try to understand whether or not there might be life there, we are now well aware of what Viking did not do and the construction of ambiguity hyperboxes and that sort of stuff to try to narrow down exactly what we know and what we do not know. But for me, the most important legacy from Viking is a historical one. That historical legacy set the framework for everything that we do now. Its success and the fact that so many people around the world cared and loved it, set the stage for the amazing outpouring of interest when Curiosity landed in 2012. Before Viking, there had never been an event in space that other than Apollo that occupied but no robotic event, more than a day or two on the front page. We were on the front page of the New York Times for 10 days, the Asahi Shimbun for 40 days. The world took notice. And as one of my favorite philosophers said, we are witnessing an amazing event. For all the time since humans began and since the Earth began, Every species on this planet has been a category one species. A category one species is one that is limited to its own planet. A category two species is one that has begin, begun to explore its own solar system. A category three species is one that has even gone outside its solar system and its domain is expanding. We are sitting here in this room the primary benefactors of an incredibly accelerated movement of one solitary species on this planet, which has gone in half a century from a category one species to a category two species, and we are now dipping our toe into becoming a category three species. When you go home at night, people ask me all the time, well, why did you come back here after you did all the things on your budget list? Bucket list, excuse me. And I say, quite truthfully, of all the things I've done in my life, you could argue whether or not this was the thing that I did the best, but you cannot argue about whether or not it was the most important. There is no question about it at all. When the history books, there won't be books, when the history kindles of 2,500 <laughs> are being read, there will not be a mention in the shortened version of Obama or Trump or any of those people, the writer will simply remark that it was this generation in the last half of the 20th century 
and the first half of the 21st that not only was the only generation to explore the solar system, but it completed that job successfully and gave that knowledge to all of mankind. Thank you very much.